Thank you. Thank you, Gil, for this very kind introduction. And I'm thrilled to be there today to present the work that we've been doing at Harvard Medical School and Boston Children's Hospital on creating this patient-centric information commons. And I'll be, sh I'll be showing you two live demos on the autism project and Philin McDermott syndrome. But first, what do we mean by precision medicine? And going back to Hippocrates, and how was the diagnosis of leukemia done before the 18th century, where there, it was a dysregulation of the four humors, phlegmatic, choleric, sanguine, and melancholic. So someone with leukemia back at the time, how was the diagnosis based on his face and how he, his comportment? And so the diagnosis of was something going wrong with sanguine, and the treatment was bloodletting. So was the treatment right for a leukemia? No, the treatment was obviously incorrect. But was the diagnosis wrong? No, the diagnosis was OK, but completely unprecise. It was too broad. The definition of it, it was, they knew it was something going wrong with the, with the blood, but it was too unprecise. And so what happened is now, for the diagnosis of leukemia, we have those main coming from the ancient definition of sanguine. We came from four, the, the four main branches of acute, chronic, lymphoblastic, and myeglinous leukemia. And today, in 2014, we have more than 200 subtypes. So the whole purpose of this precision medicine is to be able to find the true name of the disease, to go down and finding exactly the metabolic explanation of what is going on. And for each subtype, we can have a precise diagnosis that will help to have a prognosis and sometimes a treatment. And the best, if the, the, the best example we have today is in the, in the context of maybe with BRCA1 and BRCA2, where it's now even possible to have an early sign with the family history plus a genetic mutation to know that in her case with Angelina Jolie, she has 80, 87 uh, risk of, getting, of developing a breast cancer before having it. So the, that's the overall arching goal where, we, uh, where we're going, to try to be able, before the disease coming up, to be able to, be able to make a decision to have a treatment. And so in the context of autism spectrum disorder, where are we now? In 2014, the CDC's uh, reviewed a new, uh, a new prevalence. Now it's one kid out of 64 and one boy out of 42. And why it, is it so difficult to make the diagnosis of autism and to find the subtype is that there's no singular event expert measure of autism. It's really the development of multiple standardized instruments on the behavior to go and do a diagnosis of autism. And I'll show those instruments in our uh, Transmart. There's an, yes? Is, is it the same uh, prevalence in Europe? How around the world? It's increasing, increasing dramatic, dramatically. And uh, in Europe, it's around the same, of course. It's not just due to US. And there's an increasing recognition of the comorbidities around autism the CISU, the sleep bowel, autoimmune disorders. But where are we right now in the definition of finding the subtype of autism? We don't have today the subtypes. We are like leukemia 300 years ago. We are at the top of the tree. So that's why we don't have, we don't have a precise subtype diagnosis. There's no prognosis. And that's why we don't have any treatment. So this young key representation of knowledge in the context of precision medicine is extremely important. Why with autism we haven't found the subtype? Because using the behavior phenotype wasn't enough. So what do we need to do is to integrate all the data we have on those autism patients with all the diagnosis, all the exposition, all the omics data. We need to put them in one place to create an information common organized around individual patients and to take the analogy of Google Map, where we all have working production on our iPhone, all the different layers of information, satellite, postal call, structured, and even in some towns, the traffic jams. This is working in production, centered by GPS coordinate. Why can't we do the same with health? Why can't we have all those different layers of information into one central repository, where we can make all the different 
kind of correlation by centered by patient identifiers and to handle all those mapping. And using ITB2 and Transmart, we were able to make this real. So, and the purpose of creating this knowledge network information common where you were able to go from one layer to another is to create this new taxonomy. Taxonomy meaning this ontology of disease to go down the tree to find the subtype. And this will help to have an accurate diagnosis, targeted treatment, and health outcome. Those two slides come from the uh, report towards precision medicine, where the abstract is only four pages, which is amazing document. And how are we working in order to achieve this goal? Where Zach Kohani, my boss at Harvard Medical School, um, was the PI of the I2B2 project that started 10 years ago, where today it's in production not in development, in production, in more than 120 university hospitals across the world. That's my, my former hospital in Paris. And the purpose of I2B2 is to extract all the health information system from a hospital. So all the very complex phenotype around a patient coming from a health institution to extract all the DAG, EHR, biology, imaging, all those different kinds of reports and to put it into a central repository. I2B2 is great, but things were missing in the development of I2B2. You couldn't have, you don't have any complex analytical tool. You don't have any statistical software on the platform to be able to reuse the data that you collected in this model. You don't have a very easy way to load the data starting from a simple Excel sheet, and that is really missing in I2B2. And you can't integrate any omix data because of the three main reason. That's why at the time, Eric Peraklis, when he was the CIO of Johnson & Johnson, created a spin-off of I2B2 called Transmart. And that's why we are here today. But why am I showing this is to, it's something extremely important is to know the background of Transmart, where it comes from the roots of I2B2, where a lot of functionalities that we are trying to develop in Transmart has already been resolved in I2B2. So that's why looking at the documentation of I2B2 is crucial not to, to avoid reinventing the wheel sometimes. So what we, and what happened is John, when Perak, Eric Paraklis was the CIO of Johnson & Johnson, he created this data warehouse where any kind of clinical, biomarker, and contextual information could be integrated and with analytical tools and search tools, as you know. So it, it became open source on the 24th of January 2012. I remember this exact date because I had a master student working on Transmart and we didn't have access to a platform. So it was a bit risky. And we have it installed in my former hospital since May 2012. And now it's driven and maintained by the Transmart Foundation who's doing an amazing job to make it useful and to make it easy to use because at the time to be able to install it, it was extremely difficult. So. With my uh, former uh, le, le team in Paris, we did a review on in briefing in bioinformatics, looking at all the publicly available solutions where you can integrate any kind of clinical data and omics data. So those are the seven platforms that you can easily download for free and where you can do this integration. And uh, le, Bastien Rance is over there from uh, Paris. And with no surprise, the Transmart based on I2B2 is the best platform, but we needed a paper to show it. So the, trans, the main Transmart installation, as Keith showed, are now in multiple the, the different companies, and the ones in the yellow the, are the ones I was involved, or I was, or I'm still involved in. So the Transmart, what is the definition of Transmart? Everyone in the room will have a different definition based on his needs, because at the end of the day, it's really to be able to use this tool depending on what, how you want to use it. So that's my definition, but everyone can have a different definition. And that's what's amazing with, with this tool. And the way we use it is the integration of all the clinical, biological, and omics data in one place, to have it on the same server, and this integration being hypothesis-free so that you don't lose the semantic, you don't lose any of the data when you make the decision of integrating it. And then you can generate hypotheses by investigator directly on the platform by making correlation between all those different layers of information. So when I arrived uh, 14 months ago at Harvard Medical School, 
Zach Kohani asked me in the context of autism to integrate all the data he had on autism. So multiple research cohorts, I'll be presenting them. So there were a prospective research cohort with a lot of viables per patient, but also to integrate EHR data coming from I2B2 from Boston Children's Hospital, 16,000 different patients, a longitudinal phenotype on patients, and some of the patients are in common, the biobank information on this patient on autism, and also the patient consent with an S, because the most important phenotype at the end of the day is the consent. If you don't have the consent, you can't do a, any further study. So we created an ontology of the consent, and I'll, and I'll be showing that to you in the live demo, based on all the different data types that we had, and because we, we, we realized there were more than 15 different types of consent that were changing over time, and we were able to represent that so that you can make it useful, and you can reuse all this data to integrate also all the mixed data, gene expression, SNP, all exome sequencing, and now RNA-seq and everything being integrated using Transmart in the I2B2 model. And then there's two main use cases. First of all, generate the generation of hypothesis by an investigator using the drag and drop functionalities. But at the end, you can't do everything with this drag and drop. You won't be able to do a GWAS directly. It will be a bit too burdensome to do that. So we also, it's really important to have a high, the, the same way it was described yesterday, I, a direct link to the source database to do high throughput analysis directly on the database, depending on the type of user. And I'll show you two examples of, of each. So the autism cohort that we integrated today in Transmart is the Simon Samples cohort, 2,760 patients, with 6,000 to 10,000 variables per patient. The Agri cohort, autism cohort, consortium cohort. And now in the context of big data, what we have integrated, is the um, RNA, so gene expression levels coming from multiple different studies and everything has been integrated using Transmart and to know where it comes from. And I'll show you how we did the QC report and how the QC report is available in Transmart so that the end user will trust it to make sure it's not a black box. Otherwise, he won't use all the data in Transmart. At the DNA level, we wanted to have any functional unit resolution being queryable using the user interface so that you can look at a simple variant, a variant type, simple gene, password, module, everything being available in the user interface of Transmart. And at the, uh, the, uh, the genotyping arrays, that's what we also integrated. And even all exome sequencing, that was the challenging part in the context of big data. And I'll show you how we integrated this with the VCF and the annotation using ANOVA for all the samples. So we did create a pipeline using JTK, starting from FASQ file, the Orban file, joint vine calling, and to do the annotation using ANOVA, and to integrate it within Transmart. You don't have to stick to this pipeline. If you have your own pipeline, this will also work, as long as you use the last part of the integration of the VCF annotated file in Transmart. But what, and we put it in the I2B2 model, and I'll show you why we did that, and not in an external, database because we want to make fine grain correlation between any kind of the omics data with any kind of the phenotypic data. So the infrastructure we have in place, and that's my last slide before showing you a demo, is at, at Harvard Medical School on Research Computing, we have 61 terabytes of omics data. That's everything I've shown you in the previous slides. We have 5,000 processor core to process this data. Unfortunately, that's not just for us, it's shared with all Harvard, but we can use them to process all the mixed data. And then that's the firewall of Boston Children's Hospital. Why isn't everything into the central place? Because we didn't have this infrastructure at Boston Children's Hospital and the I2B2 longitudinal data, 17,000 patients with um, patient level data, we couldn't move it from Boston Children's Hospital at the time. So that's why it's in two places. And then we integrate the process data from the omics. So for example, for the, in the context of all exome sequencing, we, the BAM file and the FASQ file stays here, and it's the VCF and the annotated VCF that goes in the Oracle database. And then we integrate everything into a data creation server using Oracle being shared with Boston Children's Hospital cluster, which is not the, the, the best in the context of efficiency. And also, we have the Transmart server, which is only a full CPU server, 60 gigabytes. Why am I showing you this? That's 
what I was able to have as a postdoc when I started and doing this myself one year ago. And I'm showing you the demo on purpose on this server to show you how scalable it is. This is the smallest material you, infrastructure you could be using using Transmap, but it works, it works fine. And then, of course, it will be much more scalable in the context of having a real infrastructure. So now, I'll be showing you a live demo from this Transmart web interface on this server. So I'm connected through the VPN at, Bo at Boston Children's Hospital. And then, you can see Transmart, and the ontology representation of the data is crucial to represent all the different data types to be able to make any kind of query. So that's why in the autism project, for example, the Simon Simplex collection, 2,760 patients, in this folder, there's 6,000 to 10,000 variables per patient, and I can drill down in how the data was collected. For example, Epilepsy, that was, yes, for this national cohort for 53 patients, so all the patients have autism, and some of them, 53, have epilepsy. What do I want to do with the not show? It's me who's choosing how I want to make it. I told you the integration was hypothesis free. We didn't make any assumption. We took how the data was recorded, and now, in this database, there's 350 million facts with all the different data types, and it's running live. It wasn't pre-computed. So you have on the left, epilepsy yes, and on the right, epilepsy no or not sure. Comparison of age, sex, race. Now I want to look at, to compare it with the variable cerebral plasty. Nine patients in this national cohort. How does nine patients fit in those two groups? On the left, epilepsy yes, one patient out of the nine, and eight patients for the um, cerebral plasty in the group epilepsy, no, or not sure. The key square test is done automatically. That's great with Transmart. You generate hypotheses directly based on your raw data. So is it significant? No, it's not. If I take a continuous variable, now for example, wave extremity, it won't do a key square test. It will do a t-test. In this case, 0 0.054, is it significant? No. I'm just generating hypotheses to see and to be able to save the data, to be able to export it and to discuss, to initiate between a discussion between an investigator and his staff of bioinformatician, biostatistician. But now on the 53 patients we have that all have autism and epilepsy, so those ones, I want to see what's available in the fridge, in Boston Children's Biobank. So that's what we added with the sample explorer this query was based on autism plus epilepsy, 53 patients. Boston Children's Hospital is one of the 13 sites for this national cohort study. So that's why in the fridge we have left six patients with nine aliquots and one line per aliquot. So this query was based on phenotypic data. And you have here the information with the sample ID that and the contact information to be able to recontact the patient. Oops. Look. Back. Aha. Can't close the window. Uh, that's due to the screen. Or using the sample explorer, looking at all the protocols we integrated with autism. For example, the pre-autism consortium, so now it's a query based on the protocol title and not on based on the phenotypic data. Pre-autism consortium, I have all the data in the different facility, I group by facility, and you can see that there's 94 samples at the Bird Institute. One line per aliquot, and you have the DNA and the aliquot volume being left on each of the aliquots. And you can select the ones you're interested in and sample contact information, and to, make, to start writing an email saying, I would like additional information about the samples. So this is something we developed with Michael McDuffie in my team. And so, so with this sample explorer, it's just another layer of information. It's today in a database. 
when you, the sample explorer is already in the code of uh, Transmart, but there wasn't the link between the dataset explorer. And if there were, that I wasn't interested, if I couldn't make the link between the phenotypic data or the gene expression data, all the whole exome sequencing data with the sample explorer. So what we created is this button, this link to be able to, to make the connection. And looking at different, another type of analysis that you can do is the advanced workflow where there's R scripts in the platform already integrated, ANOVA, correlation, heat map, for example, scatter plot with linear regression. Uh, for the independent variable, I'm going to take phenotypic data, for example, subscale of irritability, and for the dependent variable, instead of taking phenotypic data, I'm going to take gene expression levels, expression arrays, human gene ST, 550 samples, drag and drop, high dimension data, where I'm going to select a gene or pathway, for example, APC, aggregate probe, apply selection, and now run. So now what's running live is at Boston Children's Hospital is from the cell file that were integrated in Transmart with making the correlation between gene expression level on one gene and a subscale of irritability. And this is running live. Where when we integrate any kind of data in Transmart, something extremely important was to show that it wasn't a black box, that you could see how the integration went on. And so before showing you this integration, now the study has finished. So you have gene expression levels right here with phenotypic levels. So you can do any kind of correlation because everything is in the same database. The, the I integration was hypothesis free. It's you, investigator, who can touch the data to be able to reuse it. If you have the, the highest level of access control in the platform, you can even download here the raw data that was used to do this analysis. And it's not just one file, it's a zip file containing the R program and all the data to be able to rerun the analysis on your computer. So an investigator, will an investigator be able to do all the analysis that will uh, conduct to a new discovery, to even to a publication? Not, of course not. Transmart is a, an amazing place to store all the data in one place, to resolve all the mappings, and then you generate hypothesis, you generate the first step of the analysis, you save it, and then you can use your own tool afterwards to go further and to reuse all this, uh, all this data. I told you that the integration of the data, we created a full pipeline of quality control to make sure that the investigator will trust how we integrated. For example, here on this 550 sample, what was the QC control to integrate it? Right click on it, show definition, QC report, and on a HTML page, you have access of the outlier removal of all the different sample, all the different techniques that we did to be able to decide if we want, which samples do we want to discard and to show what we decided so that the end user will trust the way he sees the data to be able to run his analysis. And we did the same for the phenotypic data to create a pipeline, the audit trail, so that here I can see that this 9 million variables from Simon Simplex were loaded with no error. Otherwise, it wouldn't be done, it will be a false, and I'll be able to drill and see what was going on to make sure that I, if I trust this variable or not. So as an epidemiologist by training, I didn't want Transmart to be a black box. It has to be completely transparent on how you integrate the data within the platform. And something else I wanted to show you is when we created those overlap diagrams. What we wanted to do is to be able to show with all the different type of variables that we, you have with, for all these different study, you have different overlap between, because they're all different, all different sources of data. The only thing common within this transmart installation is autism. And the, as I told you, the most important data type is the consent. So we created an ontology of the consent to represent the mind of the patient or the mind of the parents in the context of the autism. To show, for example, will the patients agree to be used for this research project or, the, or for any scientific purposes? 
What about the incidental findings? Because we had more than 15 different uh, consent and we integrated, created, creating this ontology of consent to make sure that we could reuse the data. And for example, will the patient wanted to be reconsented for incidental finding? Or media to know, do you have the consent to use the, the, the photo? Can you publish the photos? So this is really based on the raw data we had. We had so many different options in the consent. So that's why we created this ontology. As if it was phenotypic data, everything being put in the I2B2 model of Transmart. Now with this overlap diagram, where we have the first subset being Simon Simplex 2700, how many expression arrays do I have on this sample? How many overlap do you have? So that's why I do a drag and drop. And I have 101 expression arrays in the Simon Simplex, but how many do I have the consent to be able to reuse the data? So out of the 101, I have 96. That's the overlap between all those different subsets because there's a different patient count. And everything is about, get, give me all the data you have on the, a specific project, for example, on a specific domain, because it's all about we're working on different domains. In this case, it's autism. So, I don't, so that's why I have all these different database and everything was integrated and the mapping was resolved and stored with different access control within the, uh, the, uh, the platform. Something else we also integrated was the, how do we to integrate all exome sequencing data in the platform to be reusable for an investigator? So what we created is a pipeline, the one with GATK, and to have here, you have all the, the VCF information, so we store all the VCF in the I2B2 model to make sure that it can be correlated with any kind of phenotypic data. So you can make a query based on all those different elements, or more, int more interesting is the output of ANOVA. So for example, look here with RefSeq, exomic variant function, I want to look at all my patients that have a non-synonymous single nucleotide variant or a stop-gain single nucleotide variant on a certain gene. So I'm making queries, and so this is stored in the same data model. Is it scalable? Yes. And that everything we've, we've built it using Oracle, because Oracle has proven to be scalable into petabytes of storage. And what we want to do is to have everything in the same model. The same way, where do we, how did we integrate everything into it is to have the same study ID in Transmart. Why? Because I wanted to make correlation between all the different elements. So I don't use the study ID functionalities. What I do is I've put the same study ID for all my different data types, and then I resolved the access control by the path of the study or by the different applications. So I have a complex matrix of access control, but I'm not using the study ID that was created by Johnson & Johnson and Recombinant at the time. So now I want to look at all the non-synonymous single connected variant or stop gain on this gene. And with individual genotype, I only want the, the homozygote patients. And you can understand I can take any kind of data based on the output of the VCF file or ANOVA. And then we created a, a, a dashboard, Generate Waste Statistics, that won't do because it's not the same type of analysis as Generate Summary Statistics. We by added this button, uh, variant panel, to say that it's the same patient ID and the same variant ID, to, uh, from the, meaning one line from the VCF info, uh, from the VCF file. So now I have on this subset, 36 patients. And with this dashboard, I can do a drag and drop on any of the phenotypic data I have. For example, I want the population of, the breakdown population of those 36 patients I have. So I just do a drag and drop, or the sex, or another phenotypic data being the protein ratio. It's all about putting everything into one central repository and then making the correlation in your query or afterwards in the way you want to display it. I told you we didn't integrate the FASTQ file and BAM file. We only loaded the VCF and the annotations, but what we store is where the FASTQ file and BAM file are, where exactly they're stored. And so that's what we represented here with the FASTQ file and BAM file location on the Iceland server. You have here the absolute link where they are on the other server so that we are able to access those files very quickly. We can make a query based on phenotypic data, 
consent biobank and then find where is the raw BAM file. And so that's, we only store here the localization of it. So to make it useful to reuse this data. So we store everything except fast find BAM file where we store where they are on the other server here by the absolute link. So with no storage issue. Yes. And so, yes, they come from different studies. So that's why everything was based on what the patient authorized that we do. For some of the patients, I'm allowed, the, and even the consent, we had to integrate in the consent information, we had to integrate the consent dates. Because what happened, we are able to make the link with EHR only two years, maximum two years after the date they signed the consent. So two years and one day, I'm not able to make the link anymore with the, uh, the phenotypic data co coming from the cohort, the Simon Simplex, for example, and the EHR data with here, I have all the 16,000 patients with the I2B2. So at the end of the day, it's what the patient signed in the consent. So that's why, how we had to read all this consent to understand how they were structured. And there were so many different uh, issues. There wasn't just one consent for everything. So that's why we had to create this ontology of consent to be able to resolve this. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to do it. And all the all exome sequencing data, we needed to be able to, uh, to display them, not just having patient count. So we created a sequence variant explorer where you have one line per variant. It's based on the code of the sample explorer, but instead of putting biobank information, we integrated sequence variants. So one line per sequence variant. So it's the same data that you previously, previously saw on the VCF and the annotation, but now you have this nice query interface. And at the end, what you can do is making the filtering. So those are saved queries. For example, I want to look at non the, all the non-synonymous single-localized variant on the chromosome 21 with a polyphen score above 0 0.9. And I have one line per variant, so I can review them, store them, and this is linked with the phenotypic data, phenotypic data or the gene expression data to have everything integrated so that the investigator have a tool to be able to review all those variants. Paul, yes. we have a uh, remote question from Fabian Richard. Sorry? At, we have a question, how often and easily can the sample explorer database be updated? Yeah, right now you have an extract that I asked in, when I was doing my postdoc saying, can I have the data from the biobank, info, from your, the biobank information at uh, Boston Children's Hospital? So we had one extract and then this is, was a one-time extract, but what we can do, of course, is to have something more regularly and integrated with the LIMS system at Boston Children's Hospital. It's just a question of, the, it was on creating the pipeline and then making all the updates as often as you need in the context. So that's uh, the, the question of making the links with the LIMS system. But the pipeline to integrate it in Transmart is done. And uh, so now coming back to the presentation, where what I've showed you is this use case of generating hypothesis by the investigator to be able to reuse and to make correlation, but you won't be able to do all the different type of analysis. So that's why we need to be able to connect directly to the database, directly on the structured database or using an API. To, and so what we did is using a connection with R to be able to do a phenome-wide association study which is the opposite from a GWAS. There's more, there has been more than 1,800 publications of GWAS where you start from cases and controls, two groups, and you look at all the systematic differences based on the genotype. What we did with a FIWAS, where there has been 15 publications, is to do it at the way around. And you can do it once you have all the data with all the phenom integrated into the same database. So based on two uh, different genotypes to look at the systematic differences on the phenom. So we did a study in uh, PLOS computational biology on looking at the TPMT levels in the context of pharmacogenomics. What was known is when you, have, you take a tuperin drug, it's metabolized by the TPMT enzyme, where, which is coded by the TPMT gene, and there's a 93 correlation between those two. What is the purpose of the TPMT enzyme in the human body? We don't know yet. We haven't discovered what it's for, but what we know is when we take this 
drug, chopperine, it helps to metabolize it to do the its elimination. If you don't have the TPMT enzyme, it will increase the toxicity of due to this active metabolite. So that's why it's a FDA and MA recommendation based on the enzymatic level, you need to decrease the dose of TPMT in 10% or in 5% of the patients where you need to only give 10% of the dose, otherwise it can be lethal. So it's compulsory to make the dosage of the TPMT enzyme or to do the genotyping of the TPMT gene to know which type of phenotype does the patient have. Is it low activity, intermediate activity, or normal activity? What we discovered using Transmart was to, we discovered a fourth group here of very high activity. How did we do that? We conducted a phenome-wide association study based on creating two groups of patients, the one with very high activity and the one with normal, intermediate, and low activity, creating those two groups of patients. And we looked at the systematic differences with all the phenome of all the data we already had in the database, with all ICD time codes and all and confirm it with lab value. The main result of this study is this Manhattan plot. So it looks like a GWAS, but being a FIWAS, you have here 2057 Fisher tests that were conducted. So 257 dots representing aggregated ICD 10 groups. And why can't you see inflammatory bowel disease where this drug is prescribed because all the patients from all the groups have inflammatory bowel disease. So there's no differences between the two groups. What you see was above the FDR was anemia and diabetes mellinus that was overrepresented in the group with the patient with very high activity compared to all the other ones. What, and this was discovered without prior knowledge. That's the whole purpose of doing a FIWAS. And what, that, what this, does this mean? It means that those patients that were taking the normal dose of the drug were not treated enough because the disease, inflammatory bowel disease, was still active. So they had the anemia and they were, had a diabetes mellinus because they were taking too much corticotherapy. So this patient should have an increase of the dose of chuparin. And of course, we went back to all the, uh, the, the, the case report form to check this assumption, and this was confirmed. What, now going back in the context of biomedical informatics, what is the value when a medical doctor reports with using an ICD-10 code that there's an anemia or diabetes mellinus? As you know, diagnosis codes is only a proxy by, in the context of billing purposes. But because we had everything integrated in our clinical data warehouse, we were able to confirm those results with the lab test. We had all the hemoglobin levels. We had all the glycemia on those patients. So we were able to confirm that those patients had really an anemia and not just the proxy of being reported with ICD-10. And that's the beauty of integrating all those different kinds of information. So they had a decrease of the hemoglobin level and higher hyperglycemia. And this helped to discover this new subgroup of disease. What's really interesting is we only had 450 patients in this study. But because we were able to do an internal confirmation, we were able to do that. So this was using I2B2 and Transmart database with our R connection directly to it. Is it in the user interface of Transmart? Not yet, but we are working on that to be able to have GWAS and FIWAS functionality but not just reporting the results, but doing the study because you have all the data in Transmart to be able to redo, to do a GWAS starting from scratch directly on this uh, amazing tool. So now I wanted to talk about another project, PECORI. PECORI is a new funding agency in the US. For the past three, year, three, three years, this funding agency gave more than half a billion dollars per year on new type of study of patient-centered outcome research. And one of the huge studies they funded is PECORNET, $95 million in 18 months that started in January this year. The overall goal of this project is to do pragmatic clinical trials based on EHR data, to extract data from EHR and to be able to do an intervention in the EHR to do pragmatic clinical trial. So how did they fund this? Is by 29 different sub-projects, 
11 CD events, $7 million weights, multiple hospitals being together to be able to extract the data from the EHR, or 18 PPA events, Patient Forward Research Network, $1 million, and I'm co-PI of one of them. So how I interplay in this game is being one of those PPA event nodes. And within this US grant, we use Transmart as the core facility to integrate all the data. The PI of this project is a mother, a mom. Uh, uh, Megan Herbal, where her daughter, Shannon, 14 years old now, has a very rare condition. There's only 1,100 cases worldwide uh, on this disease. Shank -free, it's a shank-free mutation, Felin McDemid syndrome. All those kids have intellectual deficiency. 80% the of, the, 80 of them have autism. 40% uh, have epilepsy. They have also uh, hypotonia small phenotypic defect like dystrophic turnouts. So it's very complex to represent all the different phenotypes that there's on this patient. And what those moms with Gardin Obol, they created by themselves three years, three years ago with patient cross-roll, a patient reported registry where the parents will put all the data they had on their kids. Why? Because all, they realized that they, all this data was put on a private group on Facebook because they didn't have the infrastructure to report in this, all this information, so they created this patient-reported registry to gather all this information. But, but they quickly realized that you couldn't have all the data on those patients, where all the real data is in the, instruct, the not structured clinical notes from all the different hospitals, for example, here in the US. So what we did within this project, we couldn't make a connection with all the different hospitals. We asked the parents, to contact their healthcare providers, their GPs, everyone, to ask them the PDF of their clinical notes. And what we do is, within this project, to use CTEX, a natural language processing tool, to extract the knowledge of those clinical notes and to make it useful using Transmart to be able to present it to researchers in this community and to make the link with all the other projects in the context of doing the pragmatic clinical trials. So, what CTEX is, it's led by Savannah Gagarna at Boston Children's Hospital, is one of the best natural language processing tools to extract knowledge from the clinical notes. So it's an Apache component. So how does it work? For example, family history of obesity, but no family history of coronary heart disease from the, the sentence. There's a tokenization that will separate all the different words. A normalization, part of speech padding, shallow parsing, and then you have an entity recognition that will automatically extract the UMLS concepts the, for each of these uh, elements and to be able to say the status, is it family history? Is it um, uh, family history, yes or no? Is it a negation? To be able to find those negation out of the clinical notes, otherwise it's not useful. So that's what CTEX does. And how many metadata is there for each of the concepts? There's more than 30 of those metadata for each concept that are extracted automatically using CTEX. But the output of CTEX up to today was only a very uh, non-human readable output. It was to be computerized. So what we did is within this project is to map all the output of CTEX and to use the UMLS Unified Medical Language System to go into all those different terminologies so that the end user will be able to use it in, in Transmart and to map it also to human phenotype ontology and that's my second live demo. For this project, we needed to have this uh, Transmart working directly on the outside world. So to have a Transmart installation on the internet and not the intranet. So we did a huge development to secure it because today, I2B2 or Transmart, you can't put it directly on the internet you have to be, it has to be behind your firewall. So we, we, we worked with Harvard Information Security to go through all the security requirements to make sure that Transmart was strong enough to be able to resist to brute force attack. And we managed to get the highest level of security, meaning we can store PHI data in Transmart. Well, we don't know where we could store PHI data, but at least well, now we have the recommendation. So this is the first, to my knowledge, Transmart installation where you are able to put it directly on the internet and not just the intranet. So that's what I'm doing. Where for, and something also that was extremely important is to, for example, to make sure that the end user could change his password 
that were came up on the user mailing list. And back, so. Hello. A bit slow. That's it. So now a user account can change his uh, le, his password that was a compulsory requirement. Within this project, we represent the patient reported outcomes, creating an ontology for this disease on how the data was collected. So the, we have 200 patients and knowing if the patient, for example, has seizure. So this data comes from reported by the parents. So that was easy to integrate this registry in Transmart, but the challenge was to integrate the clinical notes. So what we created is using CTEX to process the clinical notes, and this is an example based on DC, meaning document count, 465 different documents, and patient count, 155 unique patients within this folder. So there's 465 documents. So how did we create this? And that's Sushma Patel in my team with Michael McDuffie that worked amazingly on doing this. To the starting point was you have 465 raw clinical notes that are passed and automatically we extract all the different concepts. But most important than just the concepts, we also extract the metadata. Is it positive? Is it negative? Family history, patient history. What is the body location? to create automatically this ontology. So this ontology based on SNOMED is based on the data present in those clinical notes. So each time we add a new clinical note, it will create a new ontology which has more elements. And now I can drill the in so to make sure that an investigator can reuse the data from clinical notes, which 70% of health data is unstructured. We really needed a tool like this to be able to be able for an investigator to test hypotheses based on data that he didn't think of asking in his research cohort. So for example, in the felin magdamin syndrome, they didn't think of asking because there was anything about erythema. So this is based where there's le, le concept count 22. So based on erythema, now by clicking here on this icon, the investigator is able to see this pop-up window showing how many distinct patients for this concept 22, how many patients distinct patients for this concept or below in the tree, in, in the I2B2 tree, based on 23 documents. So what will happen is automatically you have a pop-up window and you can see the raw sentences where it come from. Natural language processing is the main downside of it is people don't trust it. They need to see the raw sentences, otherwise they won't use it. So we integrated using Transmart and this um, amazing uh, de development tool to be, able, to be able to represent all the sentences. So for the patient one, there was only one sentence, and automatically you'll have these sentences and you'll see that this will be automatically unchecked. We are on the development, so it's not finished yet. To say that, and the output of natural language processing said that this is with a negation, so this won't be counted, but me as an investigator, I being a human and specialist in this domain, I can say, yes, I agree with that. And then to review all the other sentences for all the different patients, and the purpose of all this is at the end to apply validation. So that the investigator will only validate the outcomes he's interested in querying. We don't, this is a new game change. We don't validate all natural language processing upfront. We put all the, the best, one of the best tool, CTEX that will extract all the knowledge. And then it's only the investigator who's interested in his query that will validate the outcomes he's interested in. He will only query two, three, four outcomes. It will take him two minutes per outcome. And then he will trust once you do apply validation, it will automatically recalculate the. Uh, it will recalculate here the patient, the, the concept count. So we are developing it; it's not finished yet. To be able to 
you reuse this data and then you, the, the concept will become in blue, meaning that it has been validated by a human and you'll, have, you'll know who validated so that the next investigator will be able to see who validated what and then so we'll have a learning clinical data warehouse where every time someone uses it, it improves the knowledge out of it because you can't do all the validation upfront. What's amazing is with natural language processing, you are able to ask questions you didn't think of asking when the data was collected 10 years ago. So it's a game changing, be able to reuse all this knowledge. And to finish, the, the last element I wanted to show you is something that was developed also by Zach Kohani five years ago is Shrine. Shrine is when you have multiple I2B2 installation across the world between different hospitals. How do you can make queries around those hospitals? So the output of Shrine is to have only aggregate counts here between the different hospitals using the query interface. So it's more a project of IAB than a technical project. It was just to have the trust of all the different institutions to be able to reuse the data and to make the different query. So the output of Shrine is only those aggregate counts, but that because that was and there's, today there's more than five Shrine network in US between three institutions up to 61 institutions, for example, in the context of Carnet. What we succeeded with Transmart is to have Transmart as a node in the I2B2 world of Shrine, so that I can't show you a live demo because of the University of Michigan fi uh, firewall requirement with the Wi-Fi access, because I can't connect on the 88 port. But, so I did a screenshot. This is Transmart. So you have 68 females on a study in Transmart. And now with Shrine tool, you look at female, it will tell you that this installation at Harvard has 78 females plus or minus three patients. So now you have Transmart that can be a node in the, any kind of Shrine network. Shrine is another open source tool. So to be able to make the connection, we all have this issue where we have data in different source and we want to be able to integrate it. Where what Transmart succeeded today is to be able to have all the different layers of information where you can make the different connections as I've been showing you. But the real life is when you, you can't always push all the data into one central repository, which is the downside of Transmart where you need to be able to have all the authorization to put everything in the same server, the same database. But real life is your sequencing data is, will become too big and will stay at the board institute or the, the big institute in China. Your EHR data will have to stay within the firewall of the hospital. That's real life. So that's what I'm showing you right now is what is the future of I2B2 where I2B2 project was the, the, so the next project that started two weeks ago for a five-year project, and it's called, funded by the NIH BD2K, Patient-Centered Information Common. So the follow-up of I2B2 is called PIC, led also by Zach Kohani. The idea is to be able to do this, but the data stays where it was generated to create connections. So to, at the beginning, when you have a query, everything, of course, on the cloud, and to be able to generate and regenerate indexes between all those different data sets with different hash control between, because you, you won't have all the different mappings based on all those different sources. So it really depends on what you have available, PHI data or not PHI data between all those different institutions, and then you retrieve the data per type of study in the context of, of course, if the patient consented that you are able to do that, to move the data, and with the investigation, local investigation, also authorization. And within this project, we're just starting to create the sandbox where we'll have, start with neurodevelopment disorders, having seven different databases with Boston Children's Hospital, partners, but also Facebook and air climate data. And for each of them, seven of them, will have a different Transmart installation so that the local uh, 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 um, data custodians in charge of the data will, since the beginning of the project, have access using Transmart to his data source and will do the peak development across all these different data sets. And so I want to thank all the amazing team in Harvard to make all this 
possible, and also the team from the PMSDN project, the PECOE project. And to finish, I am now hiring two software developers and two postdocs. So if someone is interested, please contact me. Thank you. Paul, this is Mateo. I have nothing to say other than beautiful live demo and, and very impressive work. Thank you. Thank you. Um, likewise, very impressive. Thank you. Um, I have a question about the sample explorer. Yes. Um, perhaps I didn't grasp it, but how do you handle when there are multiple samples available of an individual of patient? That will be what we represented is one line. And what's interesting with the tool that is already in place in Transmart is you can define the level of granularity on how you want to represent the data. Is it one line per aliquot or per sample or per, and per the type of um, uh, weight was extracted, for example, the blood, the brain. Mm -hmm. So everything is, has already been resolved into when you, when you integrate the data. So it really depends in um, how your source data is, and the more viable you will add, the more efficient it will be. So yet, yeah, this it has been resolved. Does it also mean that you can maintain the hierarchy between samples, like you have a tissue sample, you uh, have, uh, derive a subsample from that, from that you derive uh, RNA and DNA, uh, such a tree, can you maintain that in that? Um, approach like previously see a tissue was able to do for instance uh, do you get my question yeah uh, can you repeat on exactly so what if you to... you have a sample for instance a tissue sample yes and from such a tissue sample you can have multiple paraffin blocks yes and from a given uh, paraffin block you can um, isolate um, DNA or RNA yes. so you have a hierarchy of samples yes uh, and um, what I was wondering whether it is possible to maintain that hierarchy uh, in your uh, setup of the sample explorer. Yes. Great. Yes. <laughs> uh, Paul, I have a question that's um, probably not an easy one um, that m many people in this room might have. And that is, um, how do we get all these nice features into Transmart 1.2? So, uh, the demo I've been showing you is on uh, the, 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 the Transmart that I've been starting at the beginning, 1.0, hotfix, to be able to have the access control. And we made a lot of different the, the development based on that. And uh, definitely everything will go into the open source uh, community. Uh, I just need to finish the paper describing all this. Uh, but then, of course, and we are happy to collaborate to help to bring this to 1.2. Why aren't we today in version 1.2? Because I'm a, a fervent be believer uh, about Oracle storage in the context of scalability because I, I'm going to put all my exome sequencing data in this I2B2 model. So I really need to have something sustainable. And I, with Postgres, I'm not sure that it will be scalable. So that's why I'm, I'm really focusing on Oracle. And uh, definitely what I want to do is to push everything into the version or maybe 1.3. Uh, but to, and, uh, and I really want to work with the foundation to make this happen. And now with the BD2K grant, where we have the, also on the future of I2B2 to, to make sure that to avoid having re reinventing the wheel on each side to, to really have something in common and that could be more interoperable between those different projects to make it much more efficiently. Because what's happening is there has been branch coming out and now it's, it's the time and there's the political willingness to do it, to, to be able to work together to reuse all those different components. Because right now, 
we have we put all the data from I2B2 in Transmart, but we some uh, so it it's really about taking the best of each of the projects to to have something more interoperable. And definitely, the API approach is the way to go. So, uh, but. We also need to make sure that uh, um, uh, we can reuse everything that has been done. So it's, we, uh, we will be working on that and uh, wanting to work with you on that. So. Thanks, Paul. I would love to uh, collaborate with you to yeah. get that in. Yeah. I just have a, a couple questions about the natural language processing that you showed. Um, when somebody validates something, does that, do you use that to inform future Processing? Do you use that as a training set or anything? Yes. Okay. Yes, that's the whole purpose of creating a learning clinical data warehouse. And I realized I completely forgot to show you the modifiers. Something extremely important in that was created in I2B2 is to have a complex to be able to represent complex phenotypes, to be able to to have those metadata on each of the findings findings. For example, if I go down on erythema, so for the concept erythema, you have here the CTEX modifiers. Because we are building it right now, there's only uh, eight of them. But for erythema, we have metadata on this concept that was extracted by CTEX. For example, you have the polarity. Is it positive or negative? For example, by definition, we only look at the positive one. But if I want to look at the, uh, the negative, I'll have to do a drag and drop and only select the negative one of where there's a, a specific mention of no erythema, or to be able to have the subject, is it patient history or family history, to be able to make queries based on metadata extracted from all the 30 different variables extracted with, using CTEX into the, uh, and to make it useful for the investigator. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, were you using CTEX to parse the consent documents, or did you no, write a no, separate no, 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 parser no, for that? No, no the, um, uh, the the consent document. There's not more than 15 variables in a con potential variable in a consent document. So this had to be manually done to look at all the different consent, put it into an Excel table with all the different variables, and then to integrate it. I, I wouldn't, you can't, uh, you, you can't, you have to be sure at 100% of what the patient consented be. You can't have any error. The most important phenotype we have is the consent. There can't be any mistakes. You can't just validate it after that. So we created the, the ontology of consent based on the real data we had of what the patient exactly signed. No. no, this consent ontology, and I've, I've been asked uh, uh, multiple times about it, it was based on the data I had. And making an overall arching consent ontology, uh, I, I, that's something we could work on, but it's really based on, at the end of the day, what is the, con based on the samples and the data you have today and you want to integrate, and you look, you really have to look at what did the patient sign to look at what were the different options, and then you create this small subset of, and to represent what they, create, what they uh, agreed on it. So creating an overall arching, it, was like, it will be like showing all SNOMED concepts would be too burdensome. They will be, it will take too much time to go all in the SNOMED hierarchy. We prune it to only show concepts in SNOMED where we had actual real data and patient data behind it. So to only show what we have based on the data. Yes, we created by hand. On no, we, we based on the based on the, the there were fifteen different options. So based on those fifteen different options, yes, we created by hand, and then to load it, of, of course, automatically. But we created this ontology by hand at the beginning to say how do we want to structure it. 